Welcome to everyone joining us on YouTube. We're so excited to be here with our Wednesday crew. Again, welcome to everyone joining us on YouTube as we're here with our wonderful Wednesday crew of mostly today, Southern South Carolina folk and one person from Texas. All right. <laughs> Oh, you're giving up Texas? You're not even, you're not even. Not, she's not thrilled of the situation now, but uh, there are a lot of good people in Texas. I want to be with all of you and I'm joining your congregation. <laughs> we would, we're looking forward to it. We want to have Texas people here. <laughs> so welcome everybody. As you know, this week is Quorum. We talked a little bit about Quorum last week. We're going to do a little bit more about it this week. If anybody has any things they want to share about it. We're going to talk a little bit about the Purim Spiel. We talked a little bit about the book, Esther, maybe read some. Yeah. For us, our program, again, this year is a little harder because obviously we had to decide, did we want to have a drive-in thing? Did we want to have something online? Since the JA is doing a drive-in thing on Sunday, we're going to do a Purim Spiel on Friday night at 5.30. So everybody's welcome to join. And then afterwards, we'll have a little Megillah reading and then we'll have uh, Friday night services. So this will be a way for us. And then Sunday for people who want to go uh, with their families to the JA, it's at 3.30 or 3 o'clock. So that should be fun. But as for Purim, it is up until very recently, the super fun holiday of Judaism. Hanukkah has probably taken over for it in many respects, but this has been the fun holiday for countless generations, probably at least 2,000 years. Um, but not everything about Purim today is as it was in the previous days. A lot of people think the Purim spiel has been around for 2,000 years, and that is almost certainly untrue. The first Purim spiels, as we know, were probably in the 16th century. So it's only been about 500 years or less that we have been doing the Purim spiel. But before that, Purim was already a celebratory holiday. Um, so what does it mean that it was a celebratory holiday? Well, we already have evidence that it was being celebrated in the second century. So by the second century, we know they were celebrating it. And later on, because there's an entire section, an entire tractate of the Talmud and the Mishnah devoted to Purim. It's called Tractate Megillah. And we get a lot of Esther, sorry. And so we see that 18, 1900 years ago, we know we were celebrating this holiday. We know what we were doing for celebrations on these holidays. Can anybody guess what the major thing everybody did on these holidays was? Drink alcohol. All right. All right. So um, this is something that we know we've been doing, that this has been some sort of fun holiday in which we've been drinking alcohol because we know it says in the Talmud that a person must become so intoxicated on Purim that he cannot tell the difference between cursed be Haman and blessed be Mordecai, right? So it also brings us to the most famous joke in the Talmud when Rabbah, Rabbah was uh, visited by Rabbi Zerah and they both got drunk together. And Rabbah killed Rabbi Zerah in a Ooh. drunken rage. The next day, Rabbah employed God, begged God's mercy, and God revived Rabbi Zerah. The next year, Rabbah invited Rabbi Zerah to come to his house for Purim again. But Rabbi Zerah answered, no, thank you. Miracles don't happen all the time. And that is one of the famous Purim joke from the Talmud. But this holiday was never what you would call a major holiday. In order to be a major holiday, it has to be part of the Torah. This is not part of the Torah. So what does it mean? It means it is not a day off from work. It's not a day where you have special services. There's one prayer you say. But it is a day that you're required to re read the Megillah, which is the scroll of Esther, Megillah Esther. And it became kind of early on a fun holiday in which you would read it in a funny way and, of course, boo Haman. 
And that's an old tradition. Why are you booing Haman? You're not actually booing him. You're trying to blot out his name. So it's kind of like if in the olden days when they had TV and if somebody said a curse word, they bleeped it out. That's what you're trying to do to Haman. You're trying to bleep out Haman because it's a bad word, kind of like the censors used to do. In fact, my, my uncle was, um, excuse me one second. Sue Blickstein is trying to join. Mark Salona. He is the, the neighbor of Rabbi Rubin. Huh? Something happened. They're all out of town. There's something happened at their house with their son, and he doesn't know how to locate them. Do you have his cell number? Yeah. Excuse me, guys, for one second. Sorry. No, no worries. Yeah. I'm going to mute everybody for one second. Sorry, I got to give Sorry about that. All right, we're back. So where were we? Oh, yes. Um, Purim was already a fun holiday trying to blot out the name of Haman, drinking excessively. You have to understand also that these holidays that are so popular always give the rabbis fits because rabbis wanted to be in charge or control the holidays. And here you have a holiday that is well known. Eventually people are dressing up in costume and there's drinking and partying. So they basically made all these part of the rules of Purim to kind of organize Purim under the umbrella of the, of the rabbis. And so what you saw 2000 years ago was a little different than today, but still this raucous kind of fun holiday, making fun, reading the Megillah. And so it was just a strange day. There are some who believe that um, it started it, as it has its origins in other holidays. And we'll talk about that in a second. But basically it came down to the rabbis instituted seven rules for Purim. The seven rules are you read the book of Esther in the evening and morning. Some say you would only read the Mishnah in the morning on it. You send food to fellow Jews. That's two. You give charity to the poor. You read the Torah. You recite this one prayer, al Hanasim. You have a poor meal. And you are not allowed to deliver eulogies or you're not allowed to fast. So if someone is buried on Purim, they're not supposed to be given a eulogy. And you don't fast on Purim because the day before is the fast of Esther. She fasts before going to visit the king. And so you're not supposed to fast also because it's a celebration. So it's basically a fun holiday. But of course, we all know it's got to be more than that because it's religious in nature. So what does it mean it's got to be more than that? Well, first of all, you have to understand this is a holiday that sets the precedent for a lot of issues Jews will face to the generations. And that is this idea of being a minority in a world and trying to survive and sometimes having to do extraordinary things to do so. They also believe that the idea of plays of some sort of spiel, which is of course, was not really something they thought about during the Roman period because during this period there were plays already by Romans and they were quite vicious in nature. And sometimes people were even killed during these plays. And so it's very unlikely that the Jews would mimic these plays. But what they did do is they did have public reenactments of the burning of Haman. So that was something that was done in certain places. Obviously, it's in the larger context of 
the burning in effigy and the burning of other religions were doing at the time. So we kind of mimicked them, but we did it just for Haman instead of doing it for actual people. Also, during this time, Jews were very literate. <clears throat> so they would talk, get, write midrash, write stories about it, and already start delivering and discussing them. So even though there wasn't any spiels, there was already this frivolity, the idea that you had to begin tzedakah, the idea that you burn Haman in effigy, the idea that you're celebrating while you're reading the Megillah, the idea of this is a dark, perverse uh, time period and we're making fun of it. So this was already there. Any questions or thoughts are already? All right, so, nope, I can't see everybody. If anybody has questions or thoughts, all right. So one question is, when did the spiel begin? Well, bef before the spiel and the yeshivas at the start of the last millennia, so 11th century, 12th century, they were already starting to, and maybe even earlier, make Purim a special day in which one of the students was kind of the master of ceremonies. And he would, I think we talked about this last week, make fun of everybody. And he would make fun of everybody, especially the rabbis and the professors. And so the idea was everyone who was anyone would get ridiculed on Purim. You probably, if you weren't getting ridiculed, you probably weren't happy about it. But it's not till probably the 1500s where we first start to see the Purim spiel that we know coming into play. Now, it was usually poor people who were doing it. Sometimes students, musicians, acrobats, artists, you know, dancers, they perform in large public places, but often they would perform in the house of wealthy people. And they may be paid in either food or in some sort of money for doing what they did. In other places, uh, especially if you were in small towns, a lot of people didn't have access to these artisans and these jugglers and what's going on. So they had people in the communities acting out the parts, but it was kind of embarrassing. So what you were supposed to do was dress up so wildly that nobody knew who you were. And so you'd act like if you're from a small town, let's say a much smaller in Savannah, everybody knows everybody. You get together, you create costumes, kind of like what's that show where they try and find who's singing it, the mass singer or something. So kind of like that. It was like, we want to be hidden. We want to still have fun. There was other characters kind of following the European ideas. You had the clown, the gesture, the fool, kind of like that. Also, Anybody see, remember Rocky? First Rock, uh, was the second one, I think, where he's running up the steps and all the kids are following him? Yeah. <laughs> That's kind of what happened. The actors would walk the streets with all the kids following after them, going towards the place where they're going to do the spiel. So it was kind of like an, a parade, kind of like a carnival coming into town or a circus coming into town. Now... When the spiel became more recognizable to us is during the Haskalah. Now, we know what the Enlightenment was. The Enlightenment, of course, is for mostly Europe. But in Jewish world, they had an Enlightenment, too, called the Haskalah. It was a roughly the same time, 18th, 19th century. This is when in Western and some parts of Central Europe, people started to be more educated, started to have more opportunities started to really concentrate on science. And it's during the Haskalah that this Purim spiel started to get really much more popular. And so you would see all of these parodies come and become more and more prominent. Not only that, not only did you, now the Haskalah is for the, you know, the more less traditional, the more liberal people. They'd also use it as a way to insult the more traditional Jews, you know, making fun of them, insulting us, you know, anyone who doesn't want to eat trafe isn't allowed here. And, and so was this 
excitement and this. Now, is Yiddish theater directly driven from the form spiel? Who knows? Probably a little bit, but probably not completely. But certainly the exuberance and the excitement and the creativity that went into the spiel moved over into the Yiddish theater. So the spiel as we know it today probably has its roots in the 19th century in terms of if you did something in the 19th century, we today would recognize what they were doing. Sometimes it would be stories of Esther, other times biblical stories. In the modern era though, we've taken it to a new level because of course we've got Hollywood and TV and movies and Broadway and, and everybody is educated. So the spiel somehow, I don't know how, has remained part of it, even though we can all turn on our TV and be, you know, humored anytime we want. So, so what we see is it started as a fun holiday. By the 13th or 14th centuries, you probably have 15th century people standing up and giving sermons, devars, soliloquies, homilies about it, moving into the 16th century the early form spiels really coming into fruition in the 19th century. And then today it's almost standard in many places. So the form spiel has of course become probably the most famous part of it. And hopefully we'll be continuing it forever. The idea of the form spiel is again, it's gotta be absurd. When you're reading the Megillah, you're supposed to get drunk and make voices and boo Heyman. And it's supposed to be fun for kids and adults. Of course, in the modern world, safe. So don't drink and drive. Now, does anybody here remember any Purim's they celebrated that they thought were fun or any Purim spiels or anything else about Purim that really resonates with you? Yeah, I'll, I'll chip in. It was a, uh, it was a space Purim. Nice. And uh, it was, you know, based on, I think, was it Star Wars or... Uh, what was that? Uh, the Mel Brooks movie. Uh, Baseballs. Oh, Baseballs. And anyway, what I really remember is Eileen dressed up as Princess Bagela, and she had a couple of bagels yeah. uh, wearing as, as, uh, as earrings. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Anybody else want to share? I don't, I don't want to share, but I have a kind of question. Hey, Larry, then Stuart. Yes, Larry. Yeah. Um, obviously, you know, people are drunk. They're getting wild. They're doing these Purim spiels. The end of the Purim story, which is very often omitted when, you know, or, or glossed over, obviously, is kind of like a mass killing. Right. Um, I mean, we've seen crowds recently, you know, um, incited. Were there ever any riots that occurred as a result of the Purim spiel and the people, did they take that as a signal to actually go out and, um, you know, basically kill the enemy? That is a good question. I don't know if there actually were riots. There were times where the governments clamped down on it. They didn't want them getting all excited and doing all these things. I don't know if ever riots were ensued by, well, that's a good question. We can look into that. It certainly seems like something that might happen with everybody getting drunk. But a lot of these spiels, I think, were done in communities where we're kind of closed off from other communities. And But yeah, we could it might, it might have turned into that. I think if anything did happen, it would probably be people going after other Jews who were their enemies as opposed to going after the populace at large. Was I correct, though, in, in kind of saying that the, the, the last part of the story seems to be, um, I wouldn't say, oh, yeah. it, but downplayed? It is today. Now, remember, in, in previous days, it wasn't like today in most spiels, it ends with Haman being hanged. We know there's more to the story. I think that is more of a modern redaction, whereas we are an empowered play country with people who are free. We don't feel this obligation to kill all of our enemies because we're not suffering. But in days past, that was not the case. So they most likely would have continued the entire story, um, whereas we kind of cut it off. Although it's not gruesome. I mean, the whole idea is we cut off with the hanging of somebody. And it's truly, you know, that's, that's still pretty gruesome for kids. But considering what kids see these days, is not as big a deal. <laughs> Stuart. Okay, we'll go Stuart, and then we'll go to Noel. 
uh, uh, I remember, you know, a lot of uh, congregations have congregants write and perform it. I think that's part of uh, the reason they go on is a bunch of us frustrated actors and writers. Uh, we did one, I did, wrote one that was done at Beth Yom where we, where I adopted the music of, um, oh, I can't remember whose name now. Uh, the guy who did George on my mind, Ray Charles. And oh, cool. every Magilla was done following, uh, using Ray Charles music with my lyrics. So for example, uh, at the party at the beginning, we had our singing Hit the Road Bosch. <laughs> and, uh, That's awesome. I, I still have this script. It went on from it went on from there, but everything in it was uh Ray Charles music. And that's, so they can get that's great. Pretty awesome. yeah. And that's part of the allure. And it's not like for frustrated actors, but you know, the idea of the poor feel it is, it is written by somebody in the community, acted out by people. Whereas in the 16th, 17th centuries, it was usually professionals. Nowadays, in most synagogues, it is not. It's just whoever enjoys doing it. Some people have acting experience. One of the best things about Purim spiels is people who are not actors and how terrible they can be. And it makes it fun for everybody. So, yeah, like, for instance, uh, for our Purim spiel, Tony, uh, Tony Lembeck wrote it. And then got all the actors, and this year these we all the actors are acted out their scenes, sent it to him on on Zoom, and then he and then Dan Flaxer, who does uh, videos for uh, WSAV, is putting it all together. And then we all sing songs. There are two songs we all sing individually because you can, obviously you can't sing together on Zoom. And he's going to put all this, all the people singing together to see how that, I don't know how that's going to work because, you know, you, you had the mute, I was singing to the music, but obviously I'm way off all the time and my voice is terrible. So well, interesting to see how, so again, it's how you decide to do it. There is nothing in Purim that says you can't do a Purim spiel online because it's not a, a major holiday. Noel, you wanted to say something. Sorry about that. No, I want you to acknowledge Sheila and Rena. Hi, Sheila and Rena. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. I hope you're Thank doing you. all right. I have a question, Rabbi. Yes, Sheila. Okay, I have a question. I'm confused. What is the correlation between the holiday of the firm and not being able to give a eulogy? The correlation is basically this is fun day. And if you're giving a eulogy, it is going to not be fun day. So most of the time, you won't bury somebody on Purim. You bury them on the next day. But that's, that's one of the rules is this is supposed to be a day of joy, pure happiness. And obviously, if you can't give a eulogy for somebody, you're probably not going to bury that person on Purim. You're going to bury them the next day if possible um, or give the eulogy the next day. But it, it, from the very, from at least 2,000 years, it is this idea, plus if people are getting drunk, plus if people are dressing in costumes, it just doesn't seem to work together. Plus, it's also you have men dressing as women. I mean, that was the only day you could do it. In some cases, there were even, of course, throughout history, it's, mostly, it's been men who've been performing these things. But there have been times where women performers have been allowed to perform. So, of course, today it doesn't matter if you're a man or woman or whatever. But uh, as we know from the Shakespeare, you know, all those days gone by in, the, in, 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 this, in plays and the theater, that it was men playing women's roles back then. Flossie. Two quick questions, Rabbi. When we're talking about drinking and going beyond, are women allowed to drink or supposed to drink? That is a very good question. Now we get into the area of women and what their responsibilities are. First thing is, are women required to follow these rules? And that is a great question because it does say um, men getting drunk. But interestingly enough, it does say uh, when the rabbis discuss, are women required to hear the Megillah? Because women are not required to hear Torah, 
right. or go to services? The answer is yes, that women are still required to read. It's one of those exceptions to the rules that says women should be listening to McGill as well. And this is also a practical thing in many respects. You can bring the children. Exactly, because the children can be there with you. So whereas one of the reasons women are not required to, to listen to the Torah on mornings is because of the children. So uh, yes, women are required to have the same halakhic responsibility for listening to Megillah. As for drinking and getting drunk, I don't know that answer. I would imagine that yes, but I have not read anything on it. I'll have to look that up. Um, that is a really good question. Um, let's, see if, let's see if, let me see if I have it right here. That does not say. Okay, next question. I was brought up Orthodox. I don't ever remember in the forum having a forum spiel. Is it just reform movement does it? It's completely up to whoever you are. The forum spiel is not required. That is a thing if you want to have fun. Not all places do it. It's become kind of a liberal synagogue big deal so people will come together and have a good time but there's no requirement for the form spiel at all so some orthodox places will and some won't remember if the more traditional you are women cannot participate uh so in the in the in the acting part so there's probably some limits there rena um is per first of all i just want to say i was born on perm oh really yes it was so happy perm birthday St. Patrick's Day, the same time. But uh, my mother always used to call me Happy Purim Birthday. Um, is is Purim like Halloween? I've seen the kids when I used to live in Rockland, the, the ultra Orthodox, running around in costumes. Did they exchange candies and things of that like item with other? You know, go to different houses. Do you know? No, they don't do that. Although, I mean, the origins of the costumes are probably pagan. I mean, they, we probably took some of this costuming from Babylonian tradition, from Roman tradition of dressing up for different things. They didn't go around getting candy, but they did get, of course, hamantashens. Right. And people would give out food to other people. And I'm sure there were probably sweets involved, whatever they could afford. But it wasn't the exact same thing as Halloween, although there is a, a definitely a chance that some of Halloween comes from Purim or vice versa. Yeah, because they would have all these ornate platters for Purim in my neighborhood. All these you ornate know? what? Ornate? Platters. Oh, platters really? Platters? Oh, and oh nuts yeah, nice. And, I mean, they really could go crazy, you know, with the expensive stuff. So I'm going to go there. Yeah, they had a lot of fun with that. Yeah, and again... The Purim holiday is especially important because there are no restrictions like the other holidays, like Sabbath, Yom Kippur, Rosh Hashanah, Sukkot, Shavuos. There are restrictions as to traveling, as to cooking, as to turning on fires, requirements for eating. So there's none of that is here. This is like one of the few big holidays, because remember Hanukkah wasn't that big of a deal, in which there are no restrictions as to all of these things. So you can carry stuff. You can carry your platters everywhere. You can walk around. You don't have to worry about all the Shabbat rules. Uh, Purim, so Purim is not on Shabbat. So, mm. uh, Larry. Uh, yeah, I think you had mentioned the last time or about um, the fact, a couple of things, that Purim is on a scroll, or the scroll of Esther. Right. And a couple of questions I probably never paid attention to. <laughs> Keep the scroll in the same place in the ark. Do, and is it there all the time or do we just bring it out and at certain times and and how and you had mentioned it's kind of a special distinction that it's on a scroll kind of like an analogy to the torah scroll of course do you think the rabbis you know intentionally or what was the motivation if you think if, if there was any thoughts behind that well it's not required to be in this in the uh in the ark probably many people would consider that not to be legitimate because it's not Torah. It is part of the Bible. There were five books of the Bible that were connected to holidays. And all five of those were put in, in scroll form for the specific holidays. And the school of Esther was one of them. So technically you can do, you would actually read all of them, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Ruth, 
on the scroll as well. Uh, but it just didn't become as popular as the Megillah Esther because Megillah Esther is centered on the scroll. Whereas for Shavuos, yes, you read the book of Ruth, but the book of Ruth is not the center of the holiday. So that's probably why it's become, but if all five of those holidays have Megillot. They're called the five Megillot. And you, there are scrolls of all of them, but one of them is way more popular than the others. Do we have scrolls for all of those? or, or We do not. We only have a scroll for, uh, for Esther. I see. But you can't, I mean, they can get the other ones. It's, and, and they're, you do read them, like, but again, the scroll reading for Purim is the center of the, where the other ones, it's kind of a side thing. And you had mentioned something else last time or one other time, maybe one of your sermons about the fact that, uh, you know, this is really a holiday of um, somewhat trepidation, that it can happen again. Um, you don't really hear much about that. I mean, you hear the drunkenness and the joyfulness and the Purim spiel and everything else. And, you know, it's almost like Hanukkah losing its, um, you know, kind of like, um, you know, the fact that that was a battle of freedom. But, yeah, let's just worry about the candles being lit and giving some presents. And it, is that more modern now? Are people coming around to the idea that uh, there is a lot of freedom and meaning behind this holiday, behind the, um, you know, that once... Um, you know, battle that took place or, or the miracle, if you want to call it a Vester or whatever happened there. Well, I think this would be, it would be the opposite. I think in many respects, this holiday has always been the fun holiday with the trepidation always in there. It's always been a sense of we struggle as minority, but we're going to have fun today because we're surviving and we need to celebrate. So that has been kind of the basis of this holiday. We know for at least 2000 years. So this kind of a, mournful start to the play this strange king probably kills off his wife for some reason esther is made queen but we don't know the reason and then was a godly intervention all of a sudden this terrible man comes and wants to kill the jews and, and we should be getting depressed but then yay we win so it's this high low high time but it's it's been i think still today we celebrate we have fun but in the back of our minds, we're always wondering, let's, you know, hoping that this never happens again. So I think that's kind of been the theme. And that's kind of the irony of the holiday itself is that it is uh, it's a holiday in which we're almost die, And then the bad guys killed and lots of people are killed, but yet we're celebrating. So it's, it's filled with irony. There's also a belief by a lot of people that this is not a true story, even in the Jewish world. It's considered an allegory by many. And so you will have some that consider it true, but really um, God is not mentioned in it. It all happens outside Israel. We don't have any confirmation on any of the characters except for possibly that Ahasuerus is Xerxes II. So it's kind of like a theme or an allegory or a satire and so this is why we can have like fun with it. We're not doing the same thing with the character of Moses or Abraham or Sarah or Samuel. You know, the book of Esther is in the third section of the Bible. It's not part of the prophets. It's not part of the Torah. So it gives you a little bit more of a, a, a chance to do something different with it. They would not do the same thing again for Moses or any of those major characters. None of these characters plays a part in other books. It's a book unto itself. And so that is why. Um, so again, as throughout history, we've been very good at making fun of ourselves, making fun of our enemies and making fun at desperate times, which has been one of the keys to our survival. And this is probably the original moment when we decided we're going to have to make fun of difficult times is Purim. But again, today in our world, we think of Purim as difficult, but not just specifically to Jews, because today when we think about Purim, it's not just worrying about Jews who are going to die because we're not in the same place that they were. We are about minorities. We're about all the world and we worry about the, the plague. We worry about uh, countries getting along. So it's, it's become a little bit more than just purely Jewish.
Plus, Hanukkah has really taken over for it in America and the liberal world. Hanukkah is really much more celebrated than Purim, probably, in, in the liberal world. Any other questions? All right, so, uh, Stuart. One of the things that I find really interesting, is, and I think it's because of these strange characteristics you mentioned, for example, about God not being mentioned specifically in the menorah, it's the only place. Uh, the Mishnah related to the Megillah are all over the place and very, very interesting. Uh, for example, it has Vashti as Nebuchadnezzar's great granddaughter. It's related to the rebuilding of the temple uh, very heavily. That's the time place. Uh, it has Esther as the mother of Cyrus the Great uh, in Mishnah. And there's just a ton of these crazy kinds of things. Uh, it actually relates the uh, birthright of uh, Haman back to King Saul, yeah, back to David. And um, Saul as a, an ancestor or a creator of the Mordecai figure uh, because they go back historically to actions of those. So the, the whole mission related to uh, the Megillah is absolutely you know, fascinating and fun because of all of these kinds of things. Yeah, and there's a lot spoken about it. Um, so yeah, oh yeah. So it's really uh, a really quite incredible. So going on to that, in the Talmud, we read, it's actually in the Jerusalem Talmud, which has another section we get up. Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Shimon, son of Lakish. Rabbi Yochanan said the books of the prophet and of the Hagiographa, which is all the books in the third section of the Bible, will become obsolete, but not the five books of the Torah. It says a great voice will not cease and it will not, and, so, and then it basically says, Rabbi Shimon ben Lachish said, so too Megillat Esther. So in this section, it says, the five books of Moses are going to always be important. All the rest of the Bible is eventually going to become obsolete, except for Esther. Mm. So it is, if you think about it, this is really the only holiday biblical holiday we celebrate that's not in the Torah. Can he expand on that and say why he thought this one would, uh, along with the Torah, not become obsolete? Is, is there kind of an additional thought there? Uh, it's, I, it, it's, I think about the fact that the memory will not cease from the descendants. It's, I, again, why does the Megillah, one, it's because we are saved. Two, it's because in the Mishnah, a lot of the characters are connected to other famous characters, as, uh, as uh, Stuart was saying. So are there descendants, people that are important? Well, the uh, Mishnah and the Talmud talk about that. They also show that this is a book in which we survive because of the creativity of Jewish people. So it's not because we're saved by somebody else, but we do it ourselves. But again, you see things like this. So again, it's considered a very important book, but it's also the only one that is a holiday unto itself. All the other holidays, if you think about it, are mostly are from the Torah, except for other holidays like Tisha B'Av, which is not um, in the Bible, Hanukkah, not in the Bible, um, Tu B'Shvat, not in the Bible. So again, those are led, this is actually in the Bible. And it's the only book of the Bible that is a holiday is based on that book entirely. And plus, it's a lot of fun. Who doesn't like dressing up? Um, any other questions before we continue? So, again, it's hard to know how to celebrate Purim because it's always going to be specific to your community. you got the spiel. Some places, obviously, in the modern world, the drinking has become an issue, understandably, with the binge drinking and driving and the understanding of issues that pe people face with alcoholism. So... This is one of those, pro these are one of these commandments 
that we would say, wait a minute, it's a commandment to get drunk. It actually says you're supposed to. It's in the Talmud. Well, how do you get around this edict? You always go through law. It's a commandment to get drunk. It's a commandment to take care of your health. If drinking affects your health, health will trump that commandment. So somebody who is going to A or has allergies or is going to be the person driving everybody home is not allowed to drink because you're breaking the health edict that supersedes the getting drunk edict. And that is a very important piece that we talk about today in the modern world. And that is that we have to really be careful with these things. We know alcohol in Judaism plays a prominent part. We're supposed to drink wine every week on Shabbos, twice. We're supposed to drink four glasses during Passover. We're supposed to actually become inebriated on this holiday of Purim. On all the holidays, other holiday, major holidays, say for Yom Kippur, there's a special prayer for the wine. And so, but there's also an understanding throughout the Talmud that excess is not something we're supposed to do. Maybe once in a while on Purim, but that's it. And so there's moderation is always preached, except for the two times, Passover Seder and um, Purim. But you're supposed to can be able to control all of these issues. That's why if you want to substitute grape juice, that is fine. How can we tell? What is the prayer for the wine? Bore pre hagafen. Does it say, blessed are you, God, who helped us create wine? No, it says, thank you, God, for the fruit of the vine. And the fruit of the vine, obviously, in most cases, they think grapes. You can drink grape juice and, and fulfill the edict. It's very obvious. So we understand that throughout history, not everybody was able to do this. I, I just have a question. Something popped into, into my, my head. You know, when you were talking about uh, Seder, drink four, four cups of wine. But, you know, cups have different sizes. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, is there uh, in the Talmud, uh, you know, something that, kind of the, defines the, the minimum size of a cup? Because sometimes it says, you know, you have to have a right. thimble full of moro or, or, you know, whatever. That is a good question. I don't know what the cup size should be for Purim. I mean, for Passover. Uh, so that's something easy to look up. And, you know, they usually do have something specific, obviously, for the yeah. sukkah. I think it says here, somewhat, the more traditionally they say, uh, eight full ounces. Uh, that's a lot of wine. That is a lot of wine. No. Especially if it's Manischewitz. <laughs> if it's Manischewitz, <laughs> I don't think it's, it's for Manischewitz. Uh, I grew up at Beth Yashurin in Houston because my grandmother was Orthodox and that's where she wanted us to be raised. And it was a horrible experience, I will have to say. Uh, they never taught us in Sunday school anything good. Everything was bad. And so uh, I, we never celebrated any uh, holidays, as I remember. I don't remember Purim. I don't remember anything. It was just straight down the line. And so... Uh, I had a terrible experience growing up there, and that's when my family left, and we went to Emmanuel, where I've been ever since. But does this happen other places? You know, it's always going to be the traditions of the place you're at. You know, we know Judaism has gone through a major transformation in the last 40 or 50 years from this on high preach downward to this more we work together. By the way, did you know Evelyn Doris Smith? At Beth Yushurin, that was my mom. She went there as well. If you knew Evelyn Smith or Frida Smith, just wondering. I don't remember them. So, yeah, but you're right. A lot of places, you have to understand this is 
speaking more to Judaism in America overall, for a long time, you had to be part of the synagogue to be part of the Jewish community. It was assumed there were still restrictions in this country. There wasn't the persecution we know of like beatings, but Jews stayed with Jews mostly. So you stayed with your people, you married your people, you worked in the outside world, you did have friends, but you really stayed connected to your community. So you had to be members of the synagogue. That's all changed. When that changed and people started saying, why do I need to be a member of the synagogue? I'm not getting anything out of it, or I don't like the people there. The synagogues had to change. And they had to become more people-centered. They had to start creating more programming and really start to understand that we have to be there for happy times and difficult moments. And so the last 40 or 50 years, we've seen synagogues completely transform from places where you had the rabbi on high and everything serious and everybody's dressed up to places that people enjoy going to with a variety of programs, social action, social justice, meals, which obviously meals was always there. So it has <laughs> been like Beth Yushurin is a wonderful place. And, you know, I know the rabbi. Beth Yushurin is the largest uh, conservative synagogue in America. And, and so it's, it has tons of programming. You go to Beth Yushurin now, they have an Orthodox service. They have a conservative service. They have a liberal service. Well, this was obviously before the pandemic. They had a family. You know, they have four services going on at the same time to meet the needs. Uh, I used to go to the Orthodox service when I was there because I knew a lot of people were part of it. So the synagogue, if it wants to remain the lifeblood of Judaism, has to continue to evolve. And this is what we did. So, uh, Flossie, that's a good question. Rabbi, what are the two times during Shabbat you drink me, uh, wine? One, I could see the Kaddish, the Kiddish. And is the other one, uh, it's, it's towards the end, Haftalah? No, no, you can't. Haftalah, actually, you don't have to drink the wine. Some say you do, but it's the Kiddish on, uh, after services, after my, uh, after morning services. Oh, really? Oh, okay. You can do kid. They don't have a separate one. You just say Bore Priya Gothen, but that is one of the ones that's become traditional that you say. Um, you can also do it at Havdalah, but some would say you don't have to drink the wine. Havdalah, though, would be considered after Shabbat is over, though. I hesitated. Sam. Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I'm not even sure the, if you're required to drink wine, or but it's just become a staple because... So many people have meals together on Sabbath after services because you're together. All right. Now, before we conclude, I want to see anybody have any ideas what we want to study the next couple of weeks. Uh, Jane. Yes, Jane. Okay. I noticed when I was younger, my thoughts are now a little different. When I read the, the Bible, the Torah, I would say, I don't understand why it's written in the negative rather than the positive. And till finally I said, well, they're just trying to tell you how not, how not to live. <laughs> but it is, it was disturbing to me for quite a while. And, and I think it is to everybody we prefer, but you remember we're taking our modern sensibilities and anachronistically placing it in something that was written thousands of years ago. If we go back to the 60s, the, the 1960s in religion, don't do this, don't do this, I'm going to slap you on the wrist or on the fingers if you're doing something wrong in school. It's only been in the very recent years that we've tried to switch it to more the more positive thing. There was nothing wrong with saying don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. That's just how life was. Now, when it comes to the modern world, we're, we're reading something that was written several thousand years ago. So we can't bring our writing styles into that. Obviously, I would rather say, do unto others as you would have them do to yourself. But actually, the quote is, do not do unto others as you would not have them do to yourself. That's just how it was written. I mean, it's just a literary style that, and, and, and again, like I said, if you go even into the early years of my life, that was still how they did things in school. 
this idea of being positive and positive consequences. And that was, that's a really new thing. Although I like it a lot better. Uh, Larry than Stuart. Uh, yeah, we woke up this morning and I went outside and I found this brochure on my doorstep uh, from the Chabad rabbi. Nice. Uh, which is very nice. And uh, But there's something in it I just wanted to read. It says, on the Shabbat before Purim, February 20th, 2021, we read the Torah portion, Parshat Zachar, which tells of how Haman's ancestors, the nation of Amalek, brazenly attacked the Jewish people uh, on their spectacular exodus from Egypt. And then it goes on to say the Torah instructs us to erase all memory of Amalek. Right. So a couple of things here. Uh, the first question is, do we all read that? Is this for bond? I, I know Judaism prides itself on the fact that no matter which Jewish congregation you went to, you know, you would be reading the same Torah portion. Uh, so yeah, do, do we as a, as a reform congregation read that same Torah portion? Because yeah. it basically tries to link, you, you had said God's name isn't mentioned, but obviously then what happens is it's almost the reverse. They're using the, uh, the holiday and going back to the Torah portion to, to say, talk about Amalek and his relationship to Haman. Um, yeah, and that's an important one. Who is Amalek? And that's all. So when the Israelites get across the Red Sea, they're attacked by the Amalekites. And since that attack, it has been our, our rule to, we are supposed to destroy all Amalekites. So they destroy the Amalekites, kill every single one of them. And then later the Amalekites pop up again. And so we destroy every single one of them. And then they pop up again and we destroy every single one of them and they pop up again. So there's no way Haman could be the descendant of Amalek if all the Amalekites had been killed over and over again. So really the Amalekites probably have become like the boogeymen, the bad guys, the basis for evil. So Amalekite is the bad guy. And so you all bad guys are linked to him. And Haman is a direct descendant of Amalek, uh, Amalek as so many others are. Is that meant to be taken literally? It's not meant to be taken literally. But so obviously, a proportion as as every Jewish congregation. Yeah, we all do the same thing. All the reform movement, some places will read the book of Esther on Saturday instead of the traditional portion that is to be read, uh, which we did this last Saturday, the now, traditional Haftor portion. Yeah. And what about the statement that we're we're commanded to um, erase uh, the Torah instruct us to erase all memory of Amalek? That's exactly what it does say. Um, but again, the idea is we're supposed to erase bad things, you know, we, but what happens later on? Bad people come back. Like if we put bad people in jail in 30 years, does that mean there's going to be no more bad people? There will be more bad. There's always bad people. The idea is we need to get rid of them, but it's every generation is supposed to do it. So the idea is we're not going to destroy hate in our society. We have to do what we can to quench or quell hate today. We have to stop bad guys today because our grandchildren are gonna be stopping bad guys in their days and it's a never ending cycle, unfortunately. So that's what it means. That's kind of what, uh, good, good, yeah. And I probably should have mentioned that about Amalek, Amalek Stewart. Yeah, actually. Relative to Amalek, the, there is uh, commentary, and I think probably it's Mishnah, but I'm not, I'm not sure, uh, saying that this goes back to Saul, where Saul was commanded uh, to destroy a, the whole nation uh, that was attacking them, and in his inherent goodness, Saul killed all the men and the so soldiers but decided to spare the women, the children, and the uh, cattle, arguing that they had not done anything. And it's that that brought about Haman, because Haman was a descendant, in fact, of those people. Uh, so here they, we took somebody who was really uh, extremely good, but in his goodness ended up creating a very bad act by essentially violating one of God's commandments. And the whole argument here becomes that uh, the Amalekites 
which we include as Hitler, uh, have survived always because of a violation of that commandment, that violation very often being done for a, uh, with, a with good intent, let me put it that way. That's, a, yeah, again. And I, I, can check, I can check which commentator it was. That, uh, oh, there's several, but it's, you know, that's probably the second most famous time moment of the Amalekites is Saul's uh, refusal to kill all of them. And so he is punished. He loses his crown and is, he's killed. But again, it's the idea that you're right. You know, we have to be very careful about stopping people who need to be stopped and protesting and doing all these things so that, you know, we, we don't let it come back. But it's always the fine line. You know, what's the fine line between teaching the next generation to work with us? and killing them so there's no second next generation. I mean, it's that fine line we always walk. All right, good stuff, Larry. A little bit different. Uh, at the end of this publication, it says, I'll read it. It says, this publication contains sacred writings. Please don't desecrate it. Then it goes on to say, however, it is not considered Seamus, S-H-A-I-M-O-S. Uh, which I assume means that it can be destroyed or in some way. It, it, what is that concept of Seamus now of what you can destroy? I know well, it's a the, side conversation, but. No, no, it's a great conversation. And it goes exactly to what we said earlier. You're not allowed or supposed to destroy the name of God, especially in Hebrew. <laughs> what is never mentioned in the book of Esther? God's name is never mentioned. So it's not against the official rules to throw it away. You can throw Hebrew away. You just can't throw anything that has the name of God or any of the many names of God. And so they say, you know, treat it with respect. Even though there's no rule that says you're not allowed to throw it away, treat it with respect. Even though there's no rule that says it can't be on the floor, you can't step on it, treat it with respect. And so this, that's the only book that you don't have that prohibition against. But so, if it had God's name, then it would have to be. Then it would be, yeah. Then it would be a whole different story. Okay. Now, for next week, anyone have any ideas of what you'd like to study? We have some things we've talked about before, but I want to make sure to do things that people would like to study. So um, anybody have any ideas or anything? Let me see the list of things we talked about. It's right here somewhere. Or, but if anybody else has any ideas, it's always great because you guys always have such great ideas. Um, here it is. We had talked about um, synagogue design. I think that's the only one we haven't done that we've talked about. We've done Leonard Bernstein. We've done, did we do Psalms? We did Psalms, right? Yeah. So, I um, another one out there possibly. Uh, great. It came, it came kind of out of Leonard Bernstein, and that was um, the idea of um, the Yigdal, the Thirteen Principles of Faith of Maimonides. You and, can do that and, if people want. And as I, you know, he's obviously one of the great thinkers, um, but there are a couple of principles there which I think warrant some discussion. You know, the fact that the Torah is not to be uh, changed or, you know, what the prophecy, um, you know, um, exists for, you know, is, is a valid kind of thing. Uh, you know, what do we think about those you know, 13 articles of faith and, you know, probably all of the other things that we talked about as well. But uh, I, I would just like to, you know. All right. So we, and we can do 13. 13. Like you want to do that? I'm sure. Okay. And th start thinking of things. So we'll do 13 articles of faith next week. But, you know, we could, do the, we could do Robert's 13 articles. You want the Robert's ones or the, you know, the famous ones? Robert's? Who is Robert's? Me. Robert, Robert Oz. <laughs> oh, you have, no, I, I, obviously, yeah. Do, do so they, you want Maimonides instead of mine, is what you're saying. Right, right, okay, right. I just, I just want to get that out there and make sure well, we're that, Robert, right. I thought you meant, I thought you meant Julia Roberts. Julia Roberts, 13 <laughs> Articles of Faith. Well, I think we can do I either. I, I go either way. The I would suggest. Of the 13 Articles versus the <laughs> conservative interpretation. Yeah, that's right. We can do that. Yeah, yeah, that would be. 
Yeah, I would suggest uh, perhaps either sending out a list of those articles or uh, a link to those articles so people can look at them in advance. And yeah, that'd be great, Larry. It's pretty easy to just go to YouTube and just Google 13, Maimonides' 13 Articles of Faith. You can. It's it's yeah. all over the place yeah, on I Google. Mean, if, you, if anybody has any specific videos or specific articles, just send that out to everybody. Okay. Because, I mean, this is a very popular, so there's a lot out there. So we could do that. All right. Sounds good. Homework. homework. Yeah. So also remember, we still have the yeah, homework. And we're going to be watching you, Michael, because we know you're a slacker when it comes to homework. None of this. It's coming tomorrow. None of this. I have it at home. The dog ate it. The dog ate it. You don't even have a dog. Well, it was the next door neighbor's dog. I left it on the subway. It was on the subway. That's right. I left it on the subway in Bluffton. Um, so also remember Pormspiel, 530 on Friday and 3 o'clock podcast today. Anybody else have anything going on that they want to mention? Also, the Jewish Film Festival is coming up and it's all free. So you just got to go to the Federation website and you can sign up for all of them. Rena. I just have a quick question about that. Um, I signed up for the first one. How do you do the other ones? Like, do you have to sign up for them individually? Um, uh, I think you do have to sign up for on there. I think you do. You have to go to the calendar of the movies and then sign up individually. I think you do. If you have any questions, I just call the Federation, see if you have trouble. I haven't signed up for them yet. Um, but that's a good question. I think it is. Does anybody know? I thought it was for each one individually. Yeah, I think it is. Yes, it is. But there's, they're all free. Yeah. So it's. Okay. And then um, uh, also, I was going to say, the. Jewish Film Festival, and then I forgot what I was going to say. The other thing, I uh, think Jeff, the Simon Wiesenthal Center ha is having a couple of films. Coming okay, great. Up. I think I sent out something that. Yeah, you did. Last, last night they did a terrific film called The Mauritanian, which um, is wow. an Academy Award nominated uh, film for not Academy Award, Golden Globe nominated in in at least the category of Best Actor. You know, they're broader than just Judaism. They're right. into all kinds of uh, social justice. But they have a film tonight. As a matter of fact, it's a short film coming up. I have no idea. Uh, it's also on what's called the short list for the Academy Award nominated short films. So you may want to take a look at that, um, the link that I had sent out already. I'm sure I sent it out to the CMI group. Great. Um, That's right. great, yeah. The only thing is keep in mind that it's California time. So when they yes. say 30, it's 9.30. And they don't send you the link. And they got to send you the link in advance, as Jeff and I found out, that they don't send it till maybe 10 minutes before or something. It's, uh, they're very yeah. slow. At it. Yeah, they, they, get, they sent me it like four minutes before, Larry. Oh. I wonder if it's like uh, trying to keep hackers and keep, you know, people who invade off of it. Could be, but if you get a chance to see that film, The Mauritanian, I mean, it is a film about social justice. And, right. You know, it's it's quite a movie. Quite yeah, a movie. I these films, I just, I need to watch them after eight when my kid goes to bed. So ones that start later, good for me. But I think the Federation Jewish movie, the, the, is you, you sign up for it and I think you have the movie or access for like 72 hours maybe or 48 hours. Yeah, that's it, Rabbi. 72 hours before and then they have the discussion. So it's from the point that the discussion 72 hours before the film. Oh, 72 hours before the discussion. Correct. Okay, that I didn't know. Thank you. So did you guys get that? So you can watch the film up to three days before the discussion. Thank you, Larry. I mean, uh, Jeff, that's great, because I did not know that. The, the opening night film seems to be quite interesting. It's yeah. It's an Israeli girl, and she lives in Germany, and she's you know, lesbian, and she's bringing her home to the parents, so it's got the intergenerational thing, it's got the guilt of the the father's <laughs> kind of thing built into it, it looks like there's a lot going yeah, on. Yeah, it's, it's supposed to be, that one is supposed to be really good. Um, they usually do a good job, I know some people on the committee, uh, and they usually do a real good job of choosing movies for it. So, excellent, all right. I look forward to seeing you guys soon. Hopefully we'll be, we're even thinking about starting in-person services in April. We're probably going to test it out. So we'll see how it goes. All right. We'll see what happens. Is that right. definite yet, Rabbi? It's not definite. We're still going to always film, but we're definitely, if we get the board approval, probably going to try in April or May 
um, to tr test. Um, a lot of churches are doing it safely. So some have been doing it for a year or more. So we we're looking at how they're doing it. How are they doing it? Uh, they basically require masks. Uh, you have to sit a certain distance apart, no singing, no choir. Uh, make sure to have stations or ushers. No um, you leave right afterwards, no schmoozing. Do you have to uh, put your name in that you want to do it? or What we're going to do to start, we're going to do that. And so there'll be reserved seating. I don't think, I think we'll have plenty of room, but let's say you want to come in one week, but you're, you're the last, you're, you're past the number that's allowed. That means you'll be the first for the next time. Yeah. So you'll, so, but a lot of them are requiring that. We're going to be a little bit more strict than most places, at least starting. But we're still going to do everything online as well. All right, cool. Always a pleasure. Okay. Stay safe, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Happy forum. Yes. And, and, and if any of you need to borrow any prince's costumes, just let me know. <laughs> <laughs> the link, the link for the Friday night is already on the uh, on Jennifer's uh, week. Yeah, she should have sent it out. Yeah. Okay. Good. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. All right, guys, stay safe. Take care. Yeah, you too. Bye.